Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Enabling Fully Automated NGS Sample Preparation Using Digital Microfluidics. I'm Archna, the Product Manager for Miro Canvas, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar is brought to you by Miraculous. To learn more about us, visit Miraculous.com. We encourage you to participate by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, just type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Also, please submit any technical issues here if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. Dr. Faye Christodoulou is the co-founder and chief scientific officer at Miraculous. She completed her PhD degree at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, Germany. Her work in RNA biology and evolutionary developmental biology has been published in Nature, Cell, and Science. Her entrepreneurial and scientific contributions have been awarded by numerous international organizations, including the first prize at the SFEE Innovation Project, the Healthcare Technology Review's Top 25 Women Leaders in Biotechnology, the Endeavor Global Network as Endeavor Greece's third female entrepreneur, and Fortune Greece's 40 Under 40. Dr. Jonathan Levine is the Senior Director of Assay Development at Interpace Biosciences and will also be the Medical Science Liaison for the GI team. He earned his PhD from the University of Maryland Medicine in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Dr. Levine completed his MBA at Johns Hopkins with a dual focus in healthcare management and finance. He has worked in the genomic, CRISPR, metabolomic, and diagnostic markets at Agilent, Metabolon, and Twist Bioscience before joining Interpace. It is great to have both of you here. Faye, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome everyone from my side too. As Artana mentioned, I'll be talking about how our product is enabling fully automated NGS sample preparation and how digital microfluidics technology uh, is uh, powering all of that. Um, at Miraculous, our mission is to advance science and improve lives faster together. And I'll start with a quick introduction to the company that was founded in 2015. Uh, Miraculous is venture-backed and we're headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, we have a team that is very uh, multicultural and diverse and also uh, equally large, more than 20 languages spoken in the, in the company at the moment, and equally large uh, uh, IP portfolio with more than 40 patent applications, uh, eight of which are already issued today. We want to help scientists reimagine automation, which today looks a lot like uh, how our transit system works. The transit system requires a lot of people that use it, large budgets, and then also riders who go to the same destination. And then planning that, uh, and once it is planned with all this heavy and, and expensive infrastructure, it is very uh, inflexible to change. So we want to bring a new solution to the table that now suddenly makes automation accessible for any sample at any moment. It doesn't require waiting to batch samples so that they can be processed in a cost-effective and timely fashion and also doesn't need a large budget and specialized infrastructure to, to host this type of solution. Our automation vision is very simple and flexible in switching protocols within a few minutes and also modifying protocols, making it customized to the needs of uh, each scientist. And lastly, the user friendliness we envision is going to enable anyone with minimal training to enjoy the uh, benefits of automation. Earlier this year, we announced the uh, commercial launch of our product, the Miro Canvas. And here you see that it's a compact, versatile, uh, personal digital microfluidic system uh, for lab and for protocol automation. It comes together with software that allows uh, the protocols to be uh, pr designed and, and executed and also has a consumable cartridge that, that is electronics free and disposable. We have tested the Miro Canvas with a wide range of kits and reagents and have uh, been effective at using it without any problems. So that makes our technology uh, agnostic to any kit and reagent. And we have also uh, read 
the output libraries uh, with four different uh, sequencing technologies so far, and the list is going to keep growing. Uh, later in the slides, we will review results from all of these four different sequencing technologies. So how does it work? Uh, Miro technology utilizes electromechanical forces that actuate droplets on an open array of electrodes. And uh, these electrodes are insulated, as you see in the schematic on the right. And we do not require any immersion in oil uh, or any direct contact of the droplets to our electronics. So in this cross-section uh, schematic that you see on the right, the droplet, as you can notice, is always sandwiched between two hydrophobic layers. And that allows it to easily slide when we apply voltage underneath in uniquely controlled electrodes. And the other thing to notice is that the droplets are always surrounded by air. So hence why no, no need for oil immersion. Now, you see a Miro canvas with the lid open in this image. There is a lot of sophistication under the hood. Um, you see the first thing to notice is the electrode uh, open array. So that is permanently part of the instrument. And the cartridge, hence, is electronics free on the right. Uh, under this electrode, uh, bed of electrodes, there are heaters and coolers, four of them, and then also four magnets. And together with other system functionalities, uh, we can enable all of the lists that you see on the left. So we can have um, dispensing of, of droplets, we can merge droplets, or we can mix them. And here the mixing can be very gentle uh, in a controlled fashion or rigor vigorous, like when you use a pipette. Um, we can incubate above and below room temperature in, um, in the heaters and, and coolers. Uh, we can thermocycle. We can do as many PCR cycles as the protocols require. And then we can engage magnets and achieve uh, bead cleanups. So wash um, beads with different buffers, uh, elute from beads. And finally, it's possible to interface uh, the digital microfluidic environment with traditional channel fluidics. And that has many advantages, especially one I mentioned in uh, the vigorous mixing abilities, which are not typical of other uh, microfluidic systems. So uh, one thing to, to uh, in, uh, underline here is that the Miro canvas is the only digital microfluidic system out there that actually allows uh, full integration of uh, any protocol steps, including PCR and bead cleanups, in the same uh, contained cartridge. And this is a cartridge. I already said it's electronics free and it's disposable. At the end of the run, uh, after the product library is collected, it can go. Um, we see it here on the left uh, in, a, uh, in, in its key components uh, as a breakdown. And you can notice how there are three reservoirs. In these reservoirs, we load all of the buffers that get uh, um, used more than once in a protocol, for example, ethanol for washes or um, wash buffers for heated um, post hybridization washes or even water or trees. Um, and then 12 individual inlets where we load the exact volumes of the master mixes and reagents that are needed in every step in the protocol. That's where we also load the sample. And that's also where we recover at the end of the run the product library. Now, it's important to see how the droplets are actually sandwiched between the, the cartridge body in gray and this uh, film in the bottom. So everything is contained, which makes the Miroc cartridge uh, a, a very secure system, even though we generate amplicons for some application from PCR cycling, uh, from cross-contamination. So from one experiment to another, we have tested and there's no, ch no chance for cross-contamination to happen as everything is securely contained in the cartridge. So what happens when you press start? Uh, we just saw a DNA droplet merge with a reaction master mix. And then after incubating, merge with magnetic particles uh, that eventually get pelleted when we engage a magnet underneath. And then uh, we follow with bead cleanups and, and removing the supernatant. On the left, we see individual droplets uh, controlled uh, in any direction of the open array of electrodes. We have designed the Miro canvas so that it's easy to use, effectively allowing us to transition from the image most of us are familiar with in the left, multi-page protocols, having to read them in detail, making sure that while we execute the, the experiment, we check that all of the steps are done properly, to the right uh, use case where we just click through some images in the screen and load 
under instruction, under direction of the system, uh, the right reagent in the right location and start the run. We have designed the Miro canvas so that it's self-installable. You see here images from uh, the homes of our team members at the start of the pandemic. Uh, they took Miro canvas, which is portable uh, at home and could carry on the progress they were making at the time, thanks to the system's portability. We have demonstrated uh, a number of uh, protocols uh, that can reproducibly run, be run on the Miro canvas. And here you see the list and specifically how there is, uh, they serve applications in, in both whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. Uh, and within whole genome sequencing, the top three are actually uh, protocols used for long read sequencing, such as PacBio, uh, SmartBell Prep version three, that's the latest by PacBio, the previous version, the version two, and also the ONT, ONT1D ligation kit. Uh, all of these are for long read sequencing. And then below we have the short read sequencing protocols such as Miro whole genome sequencing PCR free. That one takes mechanically shear DNA as input. And then the Illumina DNA PCR uh, free prep kit for rapid whole genome sequencing that receives intact uh, DNA as input and is segmentation based protocol. Uh, the Watchmaker DNA library prep kit with fragmentation that also receives intact DNA and uh, is fragmentation based protocol. And for whole exome, there is a library, uh, the twist library preparation and somatic fragmentation kit. That uh, protocol actually has PCR cycling, ranging from as low as eight all the way to more than 16 cycles for specific panels. And then for the actual uh, target enrichment using hybridization capture, we have the demonstrated results in the twist human core exome, fast hybridization target enrichment kit, and also the Agile and XDHS2 and the IDT XGen uh, kits. And these last two are coming soon for beta testing. In the bottom, you see some snapshots of the uh, application notes we have released and they're available on our website uh, upon request to be sent to you. So the list we just walked through, uh, the common denominator for all these protocols, even though they range from duration and to complexity to other parameters that need special caution, the common denominator when using the Miro Canvas is that they take 15 minutes of active engagement, maximum 15 minutes of active engagement with the system to just load the required reagents and press start the run. And the rest is true walk away automation. You only return to collect the product library that is sequence ready. And another important aspect of uh, using digital microfluidics as a technology is that because it's microfluidic, it also allows to reduce volume reagents. And for some applications, we have achieved that for as low as 75, uh, for as high as 75 uh, reagent savings, which of course makes uh, the processes most cost effective. So how do our customers use the canvas? Well, there is definitely a lot of activity in the long read sequencing space. They're the throughput of the system and the sequencers uh, are a great match. And also, again, the uh, gentle uh, handling of, of droplets in the mirror canvas uh, ensure that the integrity and the length of high molecular weight DNA are maintained throughout multi-step protocols uh, that require special attention uh, in, in some steps. So essentially uh, assuring our customers that at the end, the, they will get the longest possible reads out of their uh, sequencing run. We also have customers and you'll hear from one of them, uh, Dr. Levin later in this webinar, uh, who use the canvas for very lengthy and tedious multi-step protocols that require experts' uh, hands uh, to execute, such as hybridization and capture for target enrichment applications in exome or uh, gene panels. And there, the chemistry actually uh, allows to pull more than one libraries and enrich in parallel out of all of the different samples in one cartridge uh, and mirror canvas run. And then another very interesting area where the Miro Canvas is an excellent fit is in fast turnaround applications because it is a system waiting them there idle until a process enters the lab and it's readily available to start automation immediately of the library preparation. In these types of applications, the uh, speed is of essence and of course the quality and reliability of automation is very important and that's where Miro Canvas can contribute. So now that we know how the technology works and what 
areas it could be applied on. We can review some data together generated using the canvas. Um, all of the data we will walk through are actually from 100% fully automated runs. And the duration for each of the protocols, as I mentioned earlier, will vary between for the fastest two hours all the way to five and a half hours for the most complex ones. So here we will review first whole genome sequencing data from long read uh, sequencing technologies, starting with PacBio. Uh, here we actually use the latest kit, the SmartBuild Prep version 3. And you see on the left figure uh, a representative uh, read distribution profile of a representative Miro Canvas library. Uh, for this kit actually allows lower input of DNA. So we, we went with uh, as low as one microgram of NA24385 in this experiment. And another advantage of this new kit is that it consolidates all of the library purification uh, steps uh, in one integrated workflow, so uh, relying on bid-based uh, selection. So all of the steps were conducted in the Miro Canvas. There was no need for external instrumentation here. The library at the end was sequence ready. And on the right uh, table, you can see the, the standard um, uh, run metrics uh, after the sequencing uh, is over. So hi-fi reads, um, the uh, read length, and, and the, the quality of the reads, all at the expected levels. And now about the content of these libraries, what could be read in there? So uh, conducting a structural variant analysis to see what was uh, detectable. On the right table, you can see that we could identify the same numbers of uh, structural variants for Miro Canvas libraries as, as well as manual representative uh, libraries. So uh, same number of variants, same types of variants. So we see that there are deletions, duplications, uh, insertions, in inversions, translocations, all there. And then on the left, they even have the same distribution when comparing uh, the Miro Canvas libraries to manual. So essentially, we're mirroring uh, what was done in the hands of an expert uh, manually using the Canvas. Here, we know that the Smart Build Prep Kit can also be applied for um, sequencing shorter uh, input material. For example, in microbiome sequencing, uh, Amplicon um, can be the input to, to this uh, library preparation method. And we wanted to test whether with uh, small modifications to our script, uh, really minor modifications, it, we, it, we could actually support these types of applications. So we mocked after uh, using a linearized plasmid instead of uh, actual Amplicon in this particular example. And you can see on the table, comparing to manual, how the Miro canvas was uh, consistently yielding uh, sufficient library to proceed with sequencing and then running these library product libraries of our uh, model uh, and comparing the manual uh, to Miro Canvas, we get the same uh, electropherograms from, from tape station uh, with the peaks uh, at matching positions and, and, and intensity. So um, we're very excited with these preliminary results uh, in, in the thought that we can be serving a new application uh, that uses PAC bio sequencers. For Oxford Nanopore, here we use the 1D ligation kit, and we were able to reduce volumes all the way down to one fourth of what the kit recommends and generate quality results. So we are looking at um, uh, the, the distribution redistribution profiles of manual on the left and Miro Canvas on the right that look very uh, similar. And uh, here we used one microgram of uh, the Zymo Biomics high molecular weight DNA standard. Uh, this is a standard with a microbial community mock uh, composition. So uh, we get the same results between manual and mural canvas in terms of redistribution profiles. And then when inspecting the uh, key sequencing metrics, such as the read length, uh, the read quality, and the N50 score, uh, we also are within the same range of values uh, that are obtained from, from manual libraries when compared to mural canvas. Again, in terms of content, uh, what can be found after we read these libraries, uh, we find we could identify all of the mock uh, community members of this microbial uh, sample. Um, and uh, that those include microbial and one yeast species. So you see comparing uh, the list of manual to the list of mural canvas that they're exactly uh, the same. And recently, uh, in collaboration with a lab that uh, has mastered the difficult um, protocol of actually 
uh, yielding libraries for ultra long sequencing that requires a lot of expertise and care and attention in several steps of the one delegation keep. Uh, we, we work together and modified our script so that we can uh, serve the, these type of labs uh, with libraries that can be uh, destined for ultra long sequencing. And we used in this particular example, isolated DNA, high molecular weight DNA from HEC293 cells uh, and treated the DNA with the short read eliminator kit. And you see that we get a redistribution profile with an N50 score close to 78 KB which of course now can serve this type of application. So we're very excited about this and we'll be releasing a script uh, to the community soon. Earlier, I mentioned how the Miro Canvas is portable and by uh, referring to that, it really means it can actually be carried in a backpack as you see here on the left images. And on the right is one of our customers who literally took the Miro Canvas to the field uh, outside the lab because that's their region of interest um, and they wanted to conduct in situ sequencing, which has happened before. Uh, but with the Miro Canvas, for the first time, we enabled in situ library preparation followed by in situ sequencing. So essentially processing the sample at the region of interest. Um, and in this specific example, you see how the Miro Canvas was actually powered by solar fed uh, batteries. So that's also a, a very exciting enablement of the technology. Now, let's look at some whole genome sequencing uh, short read uh, data. And here we have used the Miro PCR free whole genome sequencing kit and tested a range of uh, inputs of uh, NA12878 DNA, uh, starting at 100 nanograms and going all the way up to 500 nanograms. And it was possible to reproducibly yield libraries that outperformed those uh, generated using traditional liquid handlers at the genome center large genome center, uh, whose uh, clinical genome um, uh, criterion is that 95% of bases are above uh, are a 20x coverage, as you can see on the figure in the left with a green dotted line. So uh, in the x-axis, we have the, the, the total sequence bases that uh, enable that. So you can see that the blue dots, which depict individual uh, Miro Canvas libraries, require less sequencing compared to the regression curve and where it intersects the green dotted line, which represents the traditional liquid handling libraries uh, that the Genome Center generated. And then for another important uh, uh, sequencing metric, the percent of heterozygous uh, SNP sensitivity, we consistently outperformed uh, in Miro Canvas libraries, the, the traditional liquid handling libraries as well. Now, using the list of the input, from uh, that same kit, uh, 100 nanograms. Uh, we also sequenced the Miro PCR free libraries using the latest um, recently released element sequencer, uh, the Aviti. And in this table, uh, we see the, the results from, a, from comparing manual to Miro Canvas. These are standard key sequencing metrics. And uh, uh, especially on the right, uh, we see how it is possible to deliver uh, confident variant calling with these F1 uh, scores for SNPs and indels that look uh, very, uh, very good. And then in the bottom uh, plot, uh, we got a near unbiased uh, coverage across the GC content of the data set. So that's also um, for both manual uh, in red and Miro Canvas libraries in, in blue. We have demonstrated the applicability of uh, Miro Canvas for rapid whole genome sequencing using the Illumina DNA prep PCR free kit. And uh, here in, in this table, you see the results, sequencing results, and so everything is subsampled uh, to 40x coverage, uh, comparing the manual to Miro Canvas runs across an input of DNA from range from 50 nanograms all the way to 500. And so across metrics, we see very comparable. Uh, numbers essentially matching uh, the bench, the, the manual experiments. Um, and despite dropping the input amount, uh, for example, in terms of the percent of bases at 20x, we get uh, the same readout. Uh, and again, uh, for this specific application, what matters the most is confident variant calling. And you see that with the F1 scores uh, for both single nucleotide variants and uh, insertions, deletions, we can definitely deliver that. Now, results on whole exome sequencing. 
uh, this application is uh, unique in the sense that the protocols require PCR cycling. And as I mentioned earlier, depends on the panel. For, for exome, it can be as few as eight cycles. For um, small gene panels, it can be more than 16 PCR cycles. And you will hear about an application of this kind in the talk later. Uh, here, this requirement is what we use to design Miro Canvas so that it is uh, possible to conduct uh, protocols protocol automation where there are PCR steps. So you can see here the results from twist human core exome, uh, fast hybridization target enrichment. And here we used individual libraries that were uh, enriched through hybridization and capture using this kit. And in each of the figures, uh, we reflect one of the important sequencing metrics, percent duplicates, percent on target, uh, the fold 80 score, and then the depth of coverage at both 20x and 30x. And in, in gray, we have replicate, uh, the bar, the gray bars reflect replicate runs uh, that are manual, and the blue bars replicate runs in Miro Canvas. So you see the results are matching. We, uh, we could match the on Miro Canvas libraries the same uh, sequencing performance as on manual libraries in the hands of ex experts. We repeated the same experiment and this time around uh, pulled eight uh, libraries into a single cartridge and conducted one Miro Canvas run comparing to one pool manual run. And in the table, again, we have uh, the key target enrichment metrics of relevance and how they compare between manual and Miro Canvas. And we see that we are within the same ranges uh, and, and have quality libraries here too. And especially when visualizing the, uh, the the reads that confidently map to targeted regions of the exome. And we have here a specific example for EGFR, exomes 2 to 10. Uh, it is possible to deliver confident variant calling uh, if we focus on the fourth exome, which is in the middle uh, we, of, of the tracks, uh, the most isolated peaks. If we compare the two top tracks, which are manual, to the two bottom tracks that are Miro Canvas runs, uh, we see the same heterozygous variant example. And this is, of course, only one representative gene. We could uh, we have data from, from more. Uh, as part of a large reliability study, we also wanted to know what is the interoperator and intersystem variability when conducting 70 exome uh, preparations using Miro Canvas. So again, here we list uh, the two most important target enrichment metrics, the 30x coverage and the fold 80 score in box plots across operators, comparing manual runs, which are depicted in uh, black dots, uh, to uh, Miro Canvas runs in shades of blue and shapes, uh, different shapes, uh, reflecting different instruments used. And you can see that everything, every Miro Canvas run is within the same range as uh, the manual runs in the hands of different operators. And here we're looking at eight operators and 14 different instruments. We went through quite a few uh, results. So to recap, we have several protocols uh, automated and ready to go for both whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing applications. In whole genome sequencing, we serve both long read and short read uh, uh, sequencers. Uh, we have reviewed together uh, results uh, from NGS sequencing today that demonstrate high quality performance of the libraries generated on Miro Canvas. Uh, the Miro Canvas allows to uh, reduce reagent volumes from the current providers you have for some of the protocols that we offer. And it also allows to fl flexibly switch from one protocol to another, literally at the press of a button, and also to flexibly modify um, the protocols that we offer with modifications, for example, the PCR cycles and, and uh, steps in the protocol where you have to customize for your needs. And again, we'll hear uh, application of that in the next talk. Uh, finally, using this type of automation minimizes uh, plastic tip uh, usage and is also great for the environment. Our vision at Miraculous is to make the most complex protocols easy and accessible to scientists everywhere. And we would love to hear from you uh, what applications from the ones we presented would serve your needs in your lab and also what uh, what else we need to add to that list of protocols that keeps growing. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much for sharing, Faye. I'd like to now welcome Jonathan. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much. And again, fantastic presentation, Faye. So today I'll be starting uh, my presentation going over some data that we produced in the lab, primarily uh, NGS data or only NGS data for risk stratification for cancer. So let's begin, shall we? Okay. So first, just to get started off, this is Arun. He is a member of the assay development team at Interpace, and most, if not all, of the work he has done with his own very hands or with the miraculous instrumentation. But a little background about Interpace and who we are. Actually, Arun is one of the most tenured people. We were established in 2014. We're a publicly traded company. Where we operate a CLIA CAP lab. We have two sites, one in New Jersey where our headquarters is, and then our diagnostic lab in Pittsburgh. And really, we have two core businesses, uh, our endocrine business and our GI business. And molecular testing is our bread and butter. And when I joined Interpace, I kept, kept thinking to myself, what a great name, right? With the mission of providing healthcare providers with the ability to avoid unneeded surgeries and also assess risk overall for cancer. And with that name, Interpace, like inner thinking like inter, which is the between or connecting and, and pace, which could be uh, the pace of movement or the rate of movement or, or even a step, like connecting the steps, so to speak, in the, in the road of diagnostic and, and, and risk stratification. Ironically though, uh, that was not the case. The, the company is actually named for a street called Interpace Parkway, which connects, of course, different streets. And actually, it's ironic because when it comes to what I do and what we do at Interpace, it's constantly thinking about the road, the roadmap for product development, the roadmap for patients. Um, and ironically, if you look at our road, uh, Interpace Parkway on the bottom right where that Google sign is, that's actually where our office is in that area. But as you can see, if you continue on the road, there's there's other healthcare companies and pharmaceutical companies. So it kind of makes sense. We're, we're upstream or up road, so to speak, of the pharmaceutical companies because we do focus on the diagnostics. So one road is specifically focused on our uh, GI business, where we have our fluid chemistry, which is branded 0.2 because it only requires 200 microliters. So 0.2 CEA or 0.2 glucose. Um, and then, of course, we have our molecular stratification or integrated molecular assay, and that's called pancreatin. And it really is to help stratify risk for pancreatic cysts. The other road uh, that we have is our endocrine road, which is specific, specifically for thi thyroid. And we have thyromir and thygenix, with thyromir being a mRNA classifier and thygenix being an NGS panel. And these are the two roads that we're always thinking about. Uh, and on the road for, for thyroid, there's a lot of different uh, tools and methodologies for diagnostics. It's a high incidence. A lot of nodules are found accidentally. Uh, and again, where we really make our bread and butter is the molecular testing axe point. Inside of the thyroid market or industry or, or discipline, the risk stratification is so important that the community ATA has Bethesda classifications, and those classifications correlate to risk. However, uh, elucidation of those risks sometimes goes beyond what is cy cytologically capable. As such, you'll see here when you have a Bethesda 3, you'll have a 60 to 30% risk of malignancy versus a Bethesda 4, which is a 10 to 40% versus a Bethesda 5, which is 45 to 75%. Molecular testing and the way that we help stratify helps, helps physicians, but also patients, of course, understand that risk. And do you need surgery? Maybe you want a hemi uh, thyroidectomy versus a full thyroidectomy, or perhaps you wait on surgery. These are the types of decisions that physicians and patients have to consider all the time. That being said, when you look at thyroid, and you can see there it's the second arrow or the bottom arrow, you can see that the survival rate is actually quite high, which is great news for those who have this condition. However, the other road less traveled, unfortunately, is the pancreatin, 
or pancreas, sorry. And as you can see, it has a very, very high mortality rate with a very low survival window. And why is that? Well, if you look at the statistics, most of the, obviously most of the patients who survive the longest are those who've been diagnosed when it is localized, when it is early and not metastasized. However, the actual finding or diagnosis or identification of said cancer is not usually localized. As you can see there, it's about 12%, with a majority usually being diagnosed in the distant or regional. This, of course, leads to the need for earlier detection, more markers, so on and so forth. And again, just to put this in perspective, pancreatic cancer, although it is not one of the highest of new incidents or new cases, it is still one of the deadliest. And this, this graphic here, you can see it's fourth it's actually, I believe, moving up to third or second. And part of the reason for that is when you look at the United States population and parts of the global population as well, although smoking is going down, diabetes and obesity are going up. And ironically, the highest risk indicator for those getting pancreatic cancer would be uh, chronic pancreatitis, which of course <laughs> is partly induced by obesity and diabetes as well. So it's really a, an ongoing problem that's only going to get worse. And you can see here it's expected to be the second leading cause of deaths uh, in, the, in the cancer space in the years to come. Also, the median age is 72, and that's not really that old anymore. Once upon a time, that might have been considered old, but in today's world, it's not considered that old anymore. So when you think about all these different things, it's a bit of a bumpy road, right? So when we're we're going on this road, we're constantly thinking about things on how to make it better, better for the patients. Our patients are always in the forethought, um, our physicians. And then, of course, with the road for the product map, right? The product roadmap, so to speak. How do we make it more efficient, faster turnaround, less hands time, um, less plastics, environmentally friendly, uh, obviously cost, but not only cost when it comes to the, the cost of the reagent, but the the cost of time. And then of course, space has its own cost. Um, do you have the space? Can you scale up? Can you not scale up? So when you deal with these type of problems on, on these bumpy roads, it's nice to have some friends. So in two th uh, back in, in May, uh, we had the formal um, press release where we, we let everyone know that we were working with Miraculous to automate the NGS pathway that uh, we use, which is a twist bioscience hybridization technique. Now, just to some quick basics I want to just touch on before we go down this road. The hybridization methodology is a little bit different than an amplicon method when you're enriching. And basically, I like the hook analogy. And people always use the hook analogy like you're fishing. And it's hooks, but it's also hook and key because you are using specific baits to pull out the DNA of interest. Now, you can make different sizes, particularly with hybridization. You can have very large panels. Uh, exomes, which, which you've seen uh, on during phase talk, but also pancancers, which are mid-sized panels, and then smaller focus panels. We'll be talking about a focus panel today, which means when you look at the sequencing metrics, the VACAR metrics, you, you expect a higher off-target. You expect um, lower uniformity in some cases. And then for our particular things, because this is multiomic, we'll be doing an RNA enrichment along with our genomics. Um, some of the metrics aren't necessarily as telling as they would like to be. That said, when you have your workflow for your enrichment, there's the conventional methodology, which is standard hybridization, which is usually overnight. And now um, more and more companies are coming out with a fast hybridization. And that is what is actually run on the mirror canvas, which is the fast hybridization. Both have their place. Um, usually you'll get the best sequencing metrics using a standard hybridization overnight. Uh, and fast hype can reach uh, comparable results, but at the end of the day, it also depends on what you need from your data. Do you need actionability? Do you need an answer versus trying to optimize Picard and see through sequencing metrics? So we actually did that. We took our small focus panel and did a direct comparison with standard hybridization, and it was done manually, uh, versus the fast hybridization on the mirror canvas.
And as you can see here, this is our off target or percent off target. You can actually see the mirror canvas outperforms in some cases the standard overnight and done manually. Now, again, this is more of a ballpark approximation because of the RNA that's in there that's not necessarily accounted for, but it produces comparable results and results that are in turn just as good. And in this case, it would seem arguably better. Now, this could also do, be to due to temperatures um, within the settings of the mirror canvas, which again are adjustable. And if for full transparency, if you were doing off bait, which again is the the nucleic acids that are away from the probe that are not on the probe and again you add padding uh, certain bases off of the probe to help with that statistic it would appear that the standard hybridization is slightly better than that of the fast hybridization again these results are not unexpected and again but the real question is great we have these sequencing metrics we can optimize them that's wonderful what does it mean from an actual actionability perspective so when we look at the data and on the left, in the left-hand column, those are different samples. And then uh, one column, you have the manual standard hybridization, and these were both done at eight plexes. And for those of you who don't know, an eight plex uh, is when you take eight samples and you hybridize the probes, and you hybridize all eight samples with that one set of probes, so one uh, tube of reaction. And that's because the samples are already barcoded that you're able to do that. And we also have the same eight plex with the it's fast time. And you can see we're getting comparable answers. Um, for the one sample, you see a T53 mutation with a very similar um, frequency of variant. And then again, with the BRAF and HRAS, again, you're seeing it, you're seeing a comparable uh, frequency of mutation. So that's great. That's exactly what you want. And this is done in an APEX. Wonderful, right? However, where does this lead us with samples, right? If everything was so easy. So it is that time of year uh, <laughs> for those of you who are uh, at least on the East Coast uh, where we have apples. And and just like when you get a bushel of apples, we're a diagnostic lab. We don't really choose the samples we get. We get what we get. And the old expression goes, um, one bad apple can ruin a bunch. Um, ironically, as you can see here, there are no bad apples. In fact, those are my boys picking out good apples. And we actually had a problem because, believe it or not, sometimes we actually get very good quality samples and they spoil the bunch. So let me explain that. As you can see here on this slide, we have on the left-hand side, samples that are derived from slides. And on the right-hand side, samples that are FNAs, fine needle aspirations. You can see the quality of the slides are more comparable with each other, even though they're lower quality overall. Where the FNA is again similar quality, but then you have that one that one sample. Just it's a good seed. What can I tell you? It's just a good apple. And what happens is, is because the quality of the DNA is so much better, it indirectly seems to be just sucking up all the sequencing reads. What that does is it kind of robs Peter to pay Paul in a way, where it's taking reads from samples that matter, uh, not samples that matter. It's taking reads from other samples in the same sequencing batch, so you're not always getting the depth that you need. Now, again, as I told you, we're always thinking about the road, the product roadmap, the patient's road to um, hopefully better health. And one of the experiments that we did try is actually doing an eight plex. And you can see here on the left and right, those are the slides. But we also tried uh, doing the higher plex. Now, there are multiple reasons why we tried. Um, and what was really interesting about that as you can see there uh, on the on the top figure, uh, just above 20%, there's that one sample that's sucking up 20% of the over 20% of the reads. But when we combine them as a 24 plex and then ran them on one sequencing sample, you see that actually it's it drops significantly from that that higher number down to around that 15% ish number. So it's not taking as many reads. So basically, what we're saying or what we saw in this, this anomaly because it's contrary to what you would think, because normally a lower plex yields better data, is that because the higher plex uh, has more samples in it, for some reason, it is pulling down that one good sample, basically allowing the heterogeneity in the sample type to be mitigated a little bit better. So we wanted to test this, right? This is a unique finding, at least for us. And we created an experiment where we had eight samples and we made uh, 
three library preps for each sample, and we ran them as either an 8-plex, a 16-plex, or 24-plex. We normalized everything, including the amount of DNA going in, because we wanted to ensure genomic equivalence were equal and not um, a factor that could be pointed to as a, as a difference for why sample uh, data might be different. And what we found was, was again, the, the, the effect maintained. So on the top there, you have a 24-plex and an 8-plex, and that's the standard hybridization done manually. And just underneath of it, you have the miraculous fast hybridization. And what you see is the distribution of the reads per sample favor the higher plex being more uniform, meaning the samples each get the same amount of sequencing versus the more dynamic amount of sequencing per sample that you see with the aplex. <clears throat> which is not only great news for dealing with a variety of sample types, but also provides us with a great utility with the near canvas, because now what it's once could handle eight samples can now handle 24. And again, this is just another representation, just showing the same thing, more uniform reads per sample. And you can see here each, each square with inside of this graph um, is one sample. And you can see that the green, that's when it was a 24-plex and done in batches um, and versus an 8-plex. And you can see uh, the distributions of the sequencing. And really what you want to pay attention to is the gap in the percentage between a red uh, of one sample and a red in another and a green in one sample and a green of another. Because the, amount of this, because the amount of sequencing is being more evenly distributed and then pulled down, the amount of difference between the sequences is also less, meaning, again, you're getting a more uniform response. This is just validating the data we saw earlier. Now that we've done that, we want to take the next step, do a direct comparison to manual versus mirror canvas. And here you can see these are the same samples. Uh, and the dark green is the standard hybridization, and the light green is the mirror canvas. And as you can see, they're comparable. Some samples are better with the mirror canvas. Some better, and again, with the mirror canvas in fast time. And others were better with the standard hybridization done manually. But again, comparable results. And again, when you just another look at this is when you break it down by sample and then done in triplicate, you can also see a very similar distribution on these triplicates as well. And again, each, each square is one sample uh, and done in triplicate. So you can see this, that distribution is, is nice and tight. So, but again, Sequencing metrics are great. What does it mean? Do you see an effect in the, the data downstream? And the answer is not really. So here we have an experiment where we have an 8-plex standard high. So this should produce the best sequencing quality uh, in this experiment. And then we have a 24-plex with the fast hybridization done in the mirror canvas. And again, the concentration is constant at 187 nanograms. So similar um, identical genomic equivalents. And this was done on the next seq And when you look at the data, you will see that different samples will produce similar results. You're able to see uh, the same mutations and very close uh, frequency of the variant. So for instance, you saw here T53 at 16.09, and again, you see it at 15.39. And again, this is just a representation uh, of some samples but again, comparable data, actionable data. And with the mirror canvas, it's all hands-off time. You don't have to sit and babysit or actually do the pipetting. And then just another look from the experiment that we showed you earlier where we did the uh, eight samples and triplicate. So you could do the eight plex versus the 16 plex versus the 24 plex. You could see a similar result. Here you have the, um, the miraculous mirror canvas on the right-hand side versus the standard manual hybridization, same amount of input. And again, you're seeing comparable results. You do have this one here where it doesn't show up on the mirror canvas, and it does show here. But that's more a factor of the fact there wasn't enough sequencing depth. Um, and then you could see the number of reads, which is too low for the variance in which we were willing to call. So that's not necessarily a, a judgment on, on the instrument or the methodology. That's more of the fact that deeper sequencing was needed overall for that. And then here we have the 24 plex, and you see once again, but in the reverse, you have the standard hive missing one where mirror canvas picked it off. And again, that's 
just an uh, emblematic of not enough sequencing for that one, that one sample. But again, the takeaway message, comparable, actionable results. Similar mutations found at a similar frequency. So that's really what the takeaway is. So why do we think we see this? This is something we've dubbed internally as the Arun-Levine effect. What we believe is going on is instead of it being linear, where the more you plex, the lower the quality of data, it's probably a bit more Gaussian. And the reason we say that is what happens is you have this, you have your DNA here and the red is, is representing off target and the green is on target and high quality. And then you have your probes of interest hybridizing and pulling down. And you have that one good quality data um, piece of DNA or sample in that case. Here is a, an example of where you add more samples that are of lower quality. However, they have like more cream targets. So even though the overall quality of that one sample might be lower than, than that of the really good sample, by adding enough of the lower quality samples, there's still enough DNA that is good enough to hybridize that would outcompete an off-target seen there in red, almost like a competitive inhibition. And this is not, like I said, it's not linear. I didn't believe it's Gaussian. There is a tipping point. You can't just plex forever and think you can keep going up and you're going to get these good results. At some point, it will. there are diminishing returns. And a big part of that has to do with your design of your panel, the size of your panel, which we talked about earlier, and the tuning of the temperatures, which, again, you can do both manually and with the mirror canvas. So just to take away from this um, and why it matters, uh, you can have democratization through high for for high throughput NGS with this instrumentation. You can do an eight or twenty four plex, meaning with a couple of instruments you could have a very high throughput lab, or you could be a very flexible lab because sometimes you get eight in, sometimes you might get forty in. You can and that comes back to how well you tune your your plexing. There's no longer a need for very large instrumentation. Space is 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 very valuable to us as it is to most. And this this little instrument has a has a small footprint, but a very high could have a very high throughput. And the age of COVID, where you where plastics are sometimes a concern, particularly with tips, you don't have to worry about that because you have that that one plastic a second handle all those samples in your hybridization reaction. You cut down reagent costs. You're actually decreasing costs to the patient to the healthcare system as a whole. And again, you're enabling multiple throughputs. So giving you that flexibility. With that said, there's still a lot more work to be done and we look forward to continuing our partnership with Miraculous. And I uh, just want to take the moment to thank our partners. Of course, Arun, a fantastic work as per usual, and thank our partners and Faye, Alejandro, Cassie, um, Frank and team uh, for all the great work that we've done together and we look forward to continuing it and bringing some of the next generation sequencing, but also technologies on the road uh, to get to the patients. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. That was great. Thank you, Faye and Jonathan, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now by clicking on the on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is uh, for Faye. Have you tested Miraculous's Miro Canvas with Kappa products? Yes. Uh, so for the, first of all, in, in the TWIST protocol, the polymerase used is the Kappa Hi-Fi. So that has been used to cycle uh, for up to uh, 16 cycles of PCR. And then we have also fully automated the Kappa Hyper Prep PCR free protocol uh, with volume reduction down to one third of what the, the kit recommends. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question will be for Jonathan. Um, can you discuss the time and cost savings achieved by using Miraculous's Miro Canvas? Thank you. Uh, yes. So um, it's variable. It depends on what you do. So right off the bat, if you're going from an 8plex to a 24plex, uh, you're saving, for instance, 
what was the cost of eight samples on the miraculous instrument is now the cost of 24. So there's a reagent saving. There's also a time saving if you can optimize your lab workflow the correct way, um, maybe saving a day in turnaround. So there is a, like I said, always thinking about that, all those different variables and how we get from the start to the end of the of the road. So part of it's time. I, I'd, if I had a ballpark it, I'd say about, about a 30%. Yeah, don't hold me to that number, but I, I would approximate it there. Great. Thank you. The next question will be for uh, Faye. Um, how can I modify protocol scripts? For example, if I want to do additional PCR cycles, can I add them and how? Right. There, there... Our, our, there's a web application where you see the, the protocol steps and there is the ability to edit uh, within a specific range that we allow, of course, uh, the, the number of PCR cycles, the duration of incubation steps, um, and, and also, yes, the duration and the number of PCR cycles and the temperatures within a specific range. Great, thanks. Um, another one for for Faye. Um, how how much customization and tuning is required to get the Miro Canvas to work for a given application, such as the ONT long read or Hive capture? So there we we offer uh, as as you saw in the list I presented, we offer scripts that are already available and tested internally. We we go through a very thorough uh, reliability campaign before we release protocols. So these are um, uh, press play type of automation. Now, if there is, you know, unique to your, as I mentioned earlier, unique to your uh, protocol, a, an incubation step that you require to spend longer uh, at the center at a certain temperature or extra numbers of P, number of PCR cycles, that is uh, something that you can of course try in our web application and send a unique script that uses as, as a foundation the existing one that we provided. And of course, we have a, an excellent team of uh, field application scientists that can guide you uh, through this process, although it's very intuitive and, and you can do it even on your own. So uh, to answer the question, the, the requirement for optimization is minimal if uh, your uh, protocol matches the one we offer. If there are small modifications, that can also be accommodated and, and is very quick to implement. Great, thank you. Um, for Jonathan, are you using other methods in parallel with the Miro Canvas or have you moved to the Miro Canvas 100%? So the the data you've seen is for, for is in development. Um, as part of Assay Dev, that's what we do is bring on the new products. The goal is of course to have everything fully automated once it hits the production lab. Um, so the, the goal would be to be fully there. We will always need to validate manually as a backup because we are a diagnostic lab, uh, but the least amount of variability and ways that we can mitigate any changes in the day-to-day, -day, uh, we always do. And again, the mirror canvas and automation as a whole is a way that we plan on getting there. Also real quick, I know there was a, a previous question about uh, cost. Uh, I did not include um, in my answer, cost savings um, of instrument acquisition. Like if we were to buy a comparable instrument um, or one of those larger robots, a more traditional instrument, it would also probably be about three to four times the cost of a, of a single Miraculous, let alone two or even three. Great, thank you. Um, for Faye, you had a list of protocols that you developed for the Miro Canvas. How did you decide to develop these protocols? So these are re re requests from scientists. Um, for example, the, the long read applications, there is definitely a challenge with, with preparing quality libraries uh, with, with uh, high molecular weight input DNA. Uh, so there are technology, as I explained in, in, in the talk, is uh, very convenient, makes the streamlines the process, and doesn't require this expert handling uh, to maintain the, the integrity of, of the DNA throughout the steps, thanks to the 
um, uh, very gentle forces, electrowetting forces that that move the droplets and and move the DNA from one uh, step to to the next in the protocol. One more question for you, Faye. Um, could you please discuss the robustness of e-wetting technologies, particularly in temperature calibration for thermal cycling and in the manufacturability of cartridges? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the second segment of the question for manufacturability of cartridges. Uh, again, what I explained, how the cartridge is electronics free has radically uh, simplified the, the QC uh, steps there. And that means that we, we no longer need to worry as previous uh, efforts had about the, uh, the quality of each electrode uh, in the cartridge consumable because these are now permanently residing in the instrument. Uh, the, the cartridge is, is just films and, and plastic. It's very uh, s straightforward to, uh, to obtain the, the parts and, and assemble. And when it comes to the instrumentation there, uh, the, the calibration for the temperatures in, for example, PCR steps or other incubation steps are done once uh, at manufacturing and then uh, are, are maintained throughout the, the life cycle of, of the product. So uh, we have several customers and several uh, instruments also internally at Miraculous and have been operating these uh, for a long time now and never had to, to uh, recalibrate temperatures so that's that has been very robust and specifically as as you know for 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 protocols like hybridization capture that is very temperature sensitive that's the best uh, example where we have quality output in in the uh, target enrichment sequencing metrics great um, thank you so much Jonathan a question for you um, you said that you multiplexed eight, 16, and 24 samples. Can you tell us a little more about the multiplexing sweet spot? Yes, um, absolutely. So um, we multiplex eight, 16, and 24. That's what you have seen. We've done other plexing as well, which you have not seen. And what I would say, the sweet spot really is correlative to your desired need. And I, again, just to repeat what I said, it's a matter of actionability versus cost efficient, cost efficiency. So if you're trying to get the optimal cost efficiency, um, higher plexing, obviously, the higher you go, the more cost efficient it is, assuming you don't need to sequence more. There is that, that balance. If you're talking about actionability, um, you know, speed and good enough to make a call are what matters most. What I will say is for the optimization of the plexing, Temperatures are very important, but also that sweet spot really correlates also to the size of your uh, of your panel. Uh, we we mainly work with small to mid sized panels. We're not doing full exomes or very large panels as such. However, the other thing to keep in mind with these panels is uniformity. Um, so ensuring that your pull down has a uniform pull down and when i when i mean by that is that your probes if you're targeting region a and region b that your probes are pulling them down equally and if you don't have a high uniformity in your probe pull down uh, the higher you plex that lack of uniformity um, will show up in your sequencing metrics in a negative way so those are all things to keep in mind Great, thank you so much. Uh, we'll just ask one last question um, for Faye. How long of fragments do you think you could work with on the Miro canvas? And what about really long fragments? Mm -hmm. So in the data I presented, uh, our, our latest preliminary data from, from this uh, new script we're developing, the N50 score is uh, at close to 78 KB. So you can imagine the, the input DNA for, for that N50 score to be achievable. Uh, is you know above 100 uh, KB. So I would say we, we haven't really uh, yet tested the system with the absolute longest. Uh, we we are using uh, the um, high molecular weight extraction uh, uh, kits that are out there. So as long as the DNA that the kit you're using uh, can be uh, extracted, that's what the the input 
material mural canvas can operate with. So I, 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 I wouldn't expect there is a limitation with that. Great. Thank you again, Faye and Jonathan, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots for hosting Miraculous's webinar. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can also be viewed on demand. LabRoots will send you an email when it's available for replay. Please feel free to share the email with your colleagues who may have missed watching it live. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>